Tonight, a voting day in the Windsor Lake by election. We are live in the east end of St. John's and we'll hear from all three candidates. It's the winning vote, guys. It's the winning vote. That's Liberal candidate Paul Anto casting his ballot at McDonald Drive Junior High School this morning. All three candidates cast ballots before 11 o'clock. And there you see PC leader and candidate Chess Crosby casting his ballot. That was at the McMoran Community Center. And newcomer Carrie Claire Neal with the NDP. She voted in Airport Heights. We start tonight with the PC party. Leader Chess Crosby is trying to win himself a seat in the House of Assembly. Here now is Jeremy Eaton has been keeping his eye on that campaign and he is live now from Chess Crosby's headquarters. So Jeremy, what was Mr. Crosby up to today? Well, Crosby had lunch with his parents and his daughter. Now the topic of conversation over that meal was how many campaigns John Crosby has been a part of and it's a lot more than his son Chess. But before they had lunch, Chess was seen at a polling station early this morning casting his ballot before an awfully important by-election. Now, he told me that there's not much he could do today but try to make some phone calls and make sure that everybody who was able to vote could get out and do it. Now, earlier today at the camp campaign headquarters where we're in the lobby of, was buzzing with people trying to get in that final push and to try to get a win in what is a crucial vote a year before the general election. And here is more of what Crosby had to say to me. Well, it's pretty obvious that this, that a win in this by-election would be a real boost and give momentum to the PC party, to the opposition party. Uh, if, however, it doesn't happen, you got to remember that this, uh, the vote total here was two-thirds liberal last time around three years ago. So it's a large hill to climb, and I think even if I come close, even if I lose, I can proclaim a victory because it will be a kind of a verdict on the Dwight Ball government that people are unhappy and that's what I'm seeing door to door. Now I asked Crosby if he was nervous leading up to the vote and he said not yet but maybe at around 8 o'clock he might get a knot in his stomach. So while I'm keeping an eye in the lobby of the headquarters of the PC party, Ryan Cook is at the Liberal camp. Ryan? Thank you very much, Jeremy. We had the chance to catch up with Paul Antle this morning as he strolled into McDonald Drive Junior High along with his wife to cast his ballot. Now, it's interesting to note none of the candidates in this by-election live in the Windsor Lake area, but they are allowed to cast votes considering, well, they're the candidates. We had a chance afterwards to, uh, to have a chat with Paul Antle and ask him how he's feeling. I feel great. I feel really good. I mean, we had uh, four or five weeks of nonstop uh, door knocking, voter ID identification and, and debates and all the rest of it. And I have to say I feel really good today. Uh, we didn't leave anything out there. Uh, we did everything we needed to do, I believe, and uh, I'm feeling good about the outcome. Now, Antil sounded very much like an athlete on a game day this morning, and perhaps that casual tone shouldn't be a surprise. After all, he has done this twice before. Antil was saying that he really hopes tonight he's not three times the loser. Says he's learned a lot from the previous two experiences, and that's going to really help him steady himself for tonight. Now, we did ask him, what if he does lose? Is it a case of three strikes and you're out? Hey, listen, I've been a liberal for a very long time, and once a liberal, always a liberal. Uh, I will always be there for the party through thick and thin, and uh, but right now I'm just trying to get through today. <laughs> Now we're here at Antle's headquarters. Things are pretty quiet here right now, but the gang is all here from the Premier to many of the sitting MHAs. I was chatting with Dwight Ball a little bit earlier, and he said that they're expecting a very close one here tonight. We'll check back in a little later on. Anthony? Thanks, Ryan. Now, as we mentioned, NDP candidate Carrie Claire Neal, she cast her ballot this morning at a polling booth at Ron Colley Elementary in Airport Heights. Neal hopes to win this district for her party, but she says win or lose, she will definitely be back on the ballot again in 2019. It's uh, really exciting to be able to mark your own name on the ballot box. I hope that everyone comes out and votes. It's uh, really exciting to be able to use our democratic rights. Uh, and uh, even though it's raining, I hope uh, you know everyone makes it out to the polls. It's been an incredible uh, campaign, an incredible experience, and uh, I will definitely make sure I'm uh, on the ballot for our next election as well.
campaigning in Windsor Lake is just about over. Time for the voters to pick a new MHA. CBCNL brings you the by-election results live as they come in. Who wins? Who loses? Stick with us tonight on Facebook Live and on YouTube shortly after the polls close at 8 o'clock Island Time. Well, an intense fall storm is headed our way starting Friday night in Labrador West and tracking eastward on Saturday. Lots of wind, rain and even some snow for northern Labrador. I'll break it all down coming up. Well, police are still talking to witnesses after yesterday's bear spray attack at a St. John's school. Now this cell phone video shows just what happened. Students who'd gathered to watch a fight were hit with what appears to be bear spray. Police still can't say for sure just what the spray was. But tonight we do know that more people went to hospital than previously reported. Here now's Peter Cowan spoke to a couple of the students who received medical help yesterday. Worst pain felt me life. It was nuts. It was only Hurt so to be bad. A fight. Breathing in, in me ears, me nostrils, me eyes, walking around, cursing me head off, but that's the way she goes, so, what so, so what did you do after that? Went to the hospital. Drank oh, a lot of milk. Drank a lot of milk, and I hate milk. Yeah. I had to drink it. They washed me eyes out, hurt bad, shower for 10 minutes straight, soap everywhere, soap in me eyes, whip air spray, killed. <laughs> Wasn't fun. Two hours just lying in a bed and dripping shit in my eyes yeah. and just washing them out. Yeah. I was throwing up the whole day. Throwing up bear mace, it was orange. We were all we next were to each other. Right, right behind the guy who got sprayed the most. Like, yeah. like we were right behind them. Yeah. And so when he fell down, it all it just all hit us three. Sprayed at us. Yeah. When, then when I was running away, I ended up running into like five cars head first, like ducking down like this. And I just couldn't do nothing. It was pretty painful, man. Were you surprised that someone at school had mace? No, not really. Not really. Not, no. not really. But not them. They don't even really come to our school. Just yeah, yeah. they're dropouts. Yeah, they're dropouts. Don't even belong here. They shouldn't be here. What do you think needs to happen in order to make sure something like this doesn't happen? I won't be able to tell you. It's, it's hard to stop it. You're not. Yeah, school. it's hard to stop stuff like that, especially when there's no cameras out back or nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and they, were, they said there's only like 15, 20 people affected. It's probably 50 to 100. Like breathing People just never told anyone. Yeah. yeah. They just didn't want to get involved with it. Yeah. Only probably 15 of us went to the hospital, maybe, yeah. around here, but probably like almost 50 people were affected by the stuff. So at least. At the least. The hallway was full of people yeah. Yeah. right up and down yeah. on both sides of it. Yeah. The Muskrat Falls Inquiry took a break from the inquiry room today. Lawyers for the various parties with standing at the inquiry went about a tour of the Muskrat Falls site. This, while 18 people involved in large-scale protests at the site, well, they were in Supreme Court because of their actions two years ago. Here now is Jacob Barker has that story. The suits were packed away at the hotel rooms, replaced by work boots, as the Muskrat Falls Inquiry took the show to the project itself. We had the overview from Mr. Marshall yesterday. It'd be great to see it actually uh, see it in as it is. As the lawyers take off to get their site tour, oh, nice. a different scene was playing out at Happy Valley Goose Bay's Supreme Court. 18 people facing contempt charges packed into the room this morning. While their thoughts are on this hearing, they're also thinking about the hearings happening across town. Those two proceedings have the same root cause. They've taken a bunch of people collectively and brutalized them in the courts. The project itself is brutalizing the uh, finances. Many are members of the Grand River Keepers and Labrador Land Protectors. They're being represented at the inquiry as well. Clearly, the fact that this project happened at all is a failure to listen to Labradorians. So uh, we're going to speak strongly on their behalf. Their concerns not about the economic and schedule overruns of the project. They are environmental about downstream effects of methylmercury and safety regarding stability of the North Spur. Our group was only awarded standing to deal with the environmental issues, so uh, it's quite limited in scope, which is certainly a challenge, but, uh, but we'll do everything we can to bring those, those concerns out. Back in court, they're pleading not guilty for breaking a court-ordered injunction at the Muskrat Falls site during large-scale protests two years ago. Nalcor, as it is obliged to do so, is, through their lawyer, attempting to prove what they've alleged, that is to say that specific individuals have reached the injunction in specific ways at specific times. The coincidence of the inquiry and the court matters coming to a head at the same time, not lost on those involved. 
the various, I guess, pillars of our society are, are kind of coming together in a, in a climax point. And it's, it's, I think, fitting that the inquiry and the proceedings are happening at the same time. Well, these proceedings will stretch across several dates this month and next. Coincidentally, so will the inquiry. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. Danny Williams has served legal notice to an outspoken critic of the Muskrat Falls project for comments made on CBC News. Williams' lawyer sent a letter to Ron Penny, a founding member of the Muskrat Falls Concerned Citizens Coalition, over comments he made in an interview with our reporter Chris O'Neill Yates. Unless Penny apologizes and retracts his statements by tomorrow, Williams says he intends to pursue a defamation lawsuit against him. Now to an update that we have about a CBC Investigate story that we brought you in June. This, what you're seeing here, is the aftermath of a head-on collision in the Goulds in January. The RNC suspected alcohol played a role, but the case remained in limbo for months because of delays getting blood evidence back from a forensic lab on the mainland that is run by the RCMP. The RNC ended up laying charges against that driver in July. The 44-year-old man was in court today charged with impaired driving causing bodily harm. His case was set over until next month. Well, some good news now. This province has a new pair of millionaires. Phoebe and Dwayne Cox were presented with their check today. The couple is from Rec Cove on Newfoundland's south coast. They plan to use the money to build a new home in that community. And they plan to use the money to take care of their family as well. The couple bought their scratch ticket on Sunday, and that's when Phoebe realized she had a winner. And I said, oh my God, Dwayne. Oh my God, Dwayne. I just won a million dollars. Dwayne, I just won a million dollars. Phoebe, it's only money. Yes, Dwayne, it's only money. It's not a hundred thousand, it's a million, we're rich. I said, stop the car, stop the car, stop the car. So I jumped out of the car with my ticket in my hand. I was going around the road, going around the road. Get in the car, Phoebe, get in the car. Come and see it. <laughs> She's running around the car thinking about the new one they're going to buy. That was incredible. Pure joy. Congratulations to them. Dwayne. <laughs>
And welcome back once again. A local independent film has snagged some big recognition at the Atlantic International Film Festival in Halifax. An audience of chairs directed by Deanne Foley takes home four awards for best feature, best director, best screenwriting, and best original score. It's based on the novel of the same name by Joan Clark, who's lived in Newfoundland for more than 30 years. It tells the story of a woman who risks it all for a second chance to be a mother. Parts of the film were shot in Torres Cove last summer. Uh, written by Newfoundlander Rosemary House and directed by Deanne Foley. It is a film about a concert pianist who has a mental breakdown and loses her children and it's her fight uh, to gain her children back. An audience of chairs will be part of the opening night gala for the St. John's Women's International Film Festival. It's one of the longest running women's film festivals in the world and this year it's turning 29. And that festival kicks off next month. Today, organizers unveiled this year's lineup. Another of the featured films, Hopeless Romantic, is directed by six different women, four of whom are Newfoundlanders. Myself. Deanne Foley, Martine Blue, and Ruth Lawrence. And it was also uh, partly written by a Newfoundland woman as well, Emily Bridger. And the film is sort of an anthology style film where a woman, uh, Anna, who's played by Linda Boyd, goes to a wedding, encounters a number of other women. They talk about romance through a series of flashbacks and this enables the main character, Anna, to make a decision herself about her own romantic choices in a particular relationship. A lot of mm -hmm. our local filmmakers, writers, screenwriters, yeah. everybody being recognized. Fantastic. Yeah, a lot of variety too. And our Women's Film Festival has uh, really been mm -hmm. able to grown. promote yeah. a lot of these uh, female filmmakers. So it's yes, great. It is fantastic. Yeah. And you know what else is fantastic? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Trying to make a segue here. <laughs> uh, Friday is looking pretty good, but then <laughs> we have a storm that's moving and Saturday, it's mostly yeah. going to affect Labrador. St. John's is probably going to be the least affected uh, by this, but we're still going to feel the effects of it. So rain and wind on the way on mm. Saturday, but let's get into the tonight and tomorrow forecast. These are the highs today on on the island looking at temperatures between 7 and 12 degrees around about 11 degrees for most of Labrador today. So we do have a frost advisory in place for most of the island with some cool temperatures and clear skies overnight tonight. The showers that have been happening on the Avalon Peninsula that will continue for a while overnight tonight, clearing off for the rest of the island and a few showers moving across Labrador tonight. Then you can see that on Friday things start to clear off quite nicely. It's the calm before the storm. Uh, so overnight lows tonight, three degrees in St. John's with a chance of showers there. Lots of uh, temperatures in uh, the negatives uh, for the rest of the island overnight tonight and chance of showers for most of Labrador and a cool northwesterly wind there. So tomorrow things are looking pretty good. A few showers possible for the west coast with the rest of the island looking clear. But then later in the day you can see the cloud move in and this is the system that I'm talking about. So it, it'll affect Labrador City in the afternoon on Friday. So this is a really a Friday night uh, into Saturday morning event. So for the island tomorrow, lots of sunshine for the east. 10 degrees as the high in St. John's, 11 in Clarenville, 14 in Marystown. And as we head west, things start to cloud over a little bit. Sunshine in Gander tomorrow, 12 degrees there. And a chance of a spit of showers on the west coast tomorrow in Corner Brook and up the northern peninsula, 13 degrees there as the high. And uh, similar temperature wise for the straight. Mary's Harbor looking at a mix of sun and cloud uh, tomorrow and for Labrador most of Labrador will see some sun and cloud during the daytime hours tomorrow right before this storm moves in Labrador City could start seeing some late day uh, showers move through on Friday evening so we do have this special weather statement in effect for the entire province pretty much everyone is going to be getting a taste of this system which is really the first fall storm of this season and 
It could be bringing some snow with it as well. You can see right here in the blue northern Labrador affected by this. Nain could get a dose of snow from this system. You can see how it'll affect mostly Labrador on Saturday. This is Friday night into Saturday morning, and the, the island probably won't start to see much of this until early Saturday morning. And throughout the day on Saturday, it'll push eastward and affect uh, the Avalon Peninsula much later in the day. I'll have more details on that a bit later. And well, thanks, Carolyn. Governor General Julie Payette certainly has a, a lot of impressive firsts on her resume, to say the least. She's been to space. She's performed with world-class orchestras, and, orchestras rather, and she's actually carried the Olympic flag. I didn't know that thing no, about her. Well, well, today was another first for the Governor General. It was her first official visit to Newfoundland and Labrador. Ah, here now, Stephen Miller was there for the reception. Too bad it wasn't great weather. Yeah, I know. <laughs> It was a warm but wet welcome for Governor General Julie Payette outside the Confederation Building this morning, where she received full military honors and a 21-gun salute. There wasn't much time for sightseeing. She met with members of the provincial government and was given the honorary title of Chief Commissioner of the Canadian Coast Guard, all before lunch. And she isn't alone. Payette is escorting a 10-foot-tall portrait of Queen Elizabeth II on a cross-country tour. This was in the ballroom at uh, Rideau Hall, which is the most important room for Rideau Hall. This is where uh, we welcome foreign uh, visitors. That's where we uh, swear in uh, cabinet and prime minister and ministers. St. John's is the first stop on that tour. They're taking advantage of some renovations happening at Rideau Hall. Instead of... Uh, taking down Her Majesty, then we decided to to see if we could send her on a cross Canada tour, and that's what she's doing. <laughs> Starting, of course, uh -huh. in the most important province. <laughs> and the rain didn't stop dozens from joining Payette on an afternoon hike around Signal Hill. Since we like people, we like moving, and uh, we like to connect, then that we could do all of three of them at the same time, everywhere we go. <laughs> A lot accomplished for someone who just touched down last night, but Payette says so far the reception is the most memorable part of the trip. The welcome at, uh, with the, the ceremonial guard uh, was unbelievable. There were people from all walks of life and, uh, and just so cool. Governor General Julie Payette wrapped up her day with a walk around Signal Hill where she was joined by members of the public. Tomorrow morning she heads off to Labrador for day two of her two-day visit to the province. Stephen Miller, CBC News, St. John's. Well, she saw lots of things she seemed to like very much. Oh, yes. She's, yeah. she's a class act, as they say. Yeah. She's so accomplished, and uh, she'll just have to come back when we have some nicer weather. Yep, yeah. and off she is to the big land, so maybe she'll have better luck with the weather there. Mm -hmm. Well, G7 leaders are in Halifax today to talk about this, the impact that plastic is having on the environment. We'll talk about that when we get back. And show you the start of a new project we're launching here at CBC.
Welcome back. Ottawa has pledged to eliminate unnecessary single-use plastics within the federal government. That announcement was made at a G7 meeting in Halifax today. This includes straws, cutlery, packaging, cups, bottles, but it also includes using our purchasing power to ensure that we uh, lead change and we just uh, drive sustainable plastics innovation. Catherine McKenna says that as part of an initiative to protect the oceans, the government aims to collect, reuse or recycle at least 75% of its plastic waste by 2030. Ottawa is also calling on other national governments to set standards for increasing the reuse and recycling of plastics rather than trashing them. So as the G7 tackles this issue of plastic pollution, CBC is focusing on plastic as well. We're launching a new series here in Atlantic Canada and it's called Waves of Change. Living near the ocean as we do means that we have a particular responsibility to try to get a grip on single-use plastics and that's what this series is all about. So we're going to start this off with a primer on the issue. Here now Zach Gowdy breaks it down for you. <music> Single-use plastic. It's a term we're hearing more and more, but do we really understand what it is or why it's such a big problem? Single-use plastics are plastics that get used one time. They're also called disposable plastics. So the ones that are on most people's radars are things like straws, uh, water bottles for disposable water, single-use packaging. Those are the big ones. But there are also things that you think of less often, like toilet paper, not made of plastic, but has plastic packaging. Some of it is consumer items, which most activism focuses on, but it's larger than that. Of all the plastic produced in the world, about a third of it is just packaging. A bottle or wrapper designed to be thrown away in minutes will last on this planet for a thousand years. So where does it all go? Because a lot of this single-use plastics, especially packaging, are very light. They blow out of landfills, they blow out of transfer stations, so even if there's no litter involved, they end up in the environment where they last for a very, very long time. In coastal regions like Atlantic Canada, a lot of that plastic winds up in the ocean. Eight million tons of plastic leaks into the ocean every year, and there it creates an altogether different problem. So when plastics enter the ocean, they act like a sponge and they absorb the oily chemicals that are around them in the water. So if you've ever had spaghetti or curry and you can't get that orange color out of your Tupperware, that's a manifestation of how plastics absorb a bunch of chemicals like tomato sauce. But in the ocean, there's less tomato sauce and more things like PCBs, flame retardants, methylmercury, and those glom onto the plastics. Plastic doesn't biodegrade. Instead, it breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces called microplastic. Animals eat that microplastic, and all the chemicals the plastic has absorbed get into the animal's system. We eat those animals, so all those harmful chemicals are getting into us. One of our main strategies to combat plastic pollution is recycling. And recycling is better than throwing plastic in the garbage. But on its own, recycling is not a solution to this problem. Plastics come from oil, natural gas, which are heavily subsidized, and they're very cheap. So the thing about plastics is when you go to recycle them, very often the price point for raw oil is lower than that for recycled plastic. So a lot of plastics don't even get recycled, even if you put them in the recycling stream. The best way to combat plastic pollution is to stop producing so much plastic in the first place. As individuals, we can stop using plastic grocery bags. We can stop buying straws or plastic soda bottles. But remember, this is a global problem. And on that scale, our individual actions can only go so far. The number one myth that I come across all the time that I spend a lot of time debunking is this scale myth, right? The idea that your individual consumer behaviors, while deeply ethical and you definitely should do them, doesn't impact marine plastic pollution, right? Two fundamentally different scales. And the problem with staying insular and thinking that your own actions scale means that you're not then extending that ethic that you clearly have into scales that do matter. Let's say you're the president of a university. Let's say you're an operation manager. Let's say you run a store. Let's say you vote. Now you can scale a little bit. So looking towards how individuals and groups of individuals and individuals in context scale is the crucial thing. And that may be the hardest part of the whole plastic problem. You or I cannot solve it alone. We have to do it together.
Well, if you have an idea on how to actually tackle this problem, you can join the CBC Waves of Change Facebook group or email us at wavesofchange at cbc.ca. Just ahead, we're live at campaign headquarters for the Tories and the Liberals in the Windsor Lake by-election. We'll hear from the NDP's Carrie Claire Neal as well. I have learned that people are ready for change. More by-election coverage when we come back. I'm Chrissy Holmes. And I'm Fred Hutton. Have we got a special treat for you tomorrow morning on the St. John's Morning Show. Jim Cuddy of Blue Rodeo is going to be our special guest. Even better, we've got a pair of tickets to give away to his Sunday night show, but we're going to make you work for them. That's right. It's Blue Rodeo Lyrical Challenge on the St. John's Morning Show Friday morning. If you live in the district of Windsor Lake, there's still time to cast a ballot. The polls for the by-election are open until 8 o'clock this evening. But after that, the votes will be counted, and we'll find out who is going to represent that district until next year's general election. And we'll check back in with uh, the campaigns now in the East End of St. John's. So let's start with the Tories. Here now is Jeremy Eaton is outside Chess Crosby's headquarters, although he looks like he's inside there now. Good thing given the weather. Jeremy. Yeah, well, we're sort of inside. We're in the lobby of the uh, building, and uh, in this door behind me, that's where uh, Chess Crosby actually just left the building, but that's where his team is working away, and there's not a lot of room in there, so they didn't want us inside until the polls close at 8 p.m. So we were trying to get a volunteer or a supporter to come out and talk to us, but they're simply, they tell us they're just too busy, too busy trying to get the last few people out so that they can get out to vote. Now, as we were standing here, a number of MHAs, uh, PC MHAs, obviously have come by to, uh, to help out. Some former PCs have come by, some former government staffers as well. So there is a lot of support in that room here behind us, and we are going to see what that room looks like when we do the Facebook Live later today. Now, Mr. Crosby is sort of stepping out of the way, and he'll wait and probably come back later in this evening. I'm not sure where he's going to go and watch where the votes come in, 
but he'll probably be, he left with his daughter, so he'll probably be with his family. Now the polls will close at 8, and then we'll sort of slowly see the numbers come in and try to figure out uh, who is going to win this election. It's the first time that Crosby has ever run for an MHA seat, and he is the leader of the opposition party. So a lot of eyes are on this by-election, so it's not just a regular by-election. And since it's not as exciting here as it is at the Liberal camp, we're going to throw it over to Ryan Cook, who's there with probably some people from the Liberal Party. Thank you very much, Jeremy. I'm joined here with the Finance Minister, Tom Osborne. Tom, first of all, can you just walk us through what we're seeing over here? All the action seems to be in this corner over here. What, what's happening? Uh, well, as our scrutineers uh, send back uh, folders or files that uh, have uh, the people who voted at the, the polling booth, it comes in here, we mark it off, uh, send it out as soon as we get one that goes out to somebody else who goes out to the door and uh, gets people out to the polls to vote. Right on. So this is all a very concerted volunteer effort. Can you just kind of talk about, I guess, the, the help that you guys have here at the headquarters? Well, it's fantastic. I mean, the campaign headquarters has been uh, a constant flow of people in and out all day. Mm -hmm. uh, as quick as we get a poll ready for somebody to get back out at the doors again, uh, a volunteer takes that poll, they're out. and. Uh, you know, so it's it's running very smoothly, uh, very efficient, and uh, it's it's quite exciting. It's it's exciting to see the the flow of people coming and going. Yeah. Do you ever get used to this, or is it you know so exciting every time? It's always exciting. Yeah. Uh, I love it. Uh, I mean, I've seen so many uh, campaigns, uh, you know, by elections and, and general elections, and uh, and I always get excited by it. Mm. So what, what exactly are you expecting tonight? I was speaking with, uh, with the Premier earlier. You said it's going to be a pretty close one. Do you have any, any better idea now? Well, you know, it's my birthday, so I'm <laughs> looking forward to a celebration. And uh, if I can ask for one birthday gift from the, anybody out in, uh, in this district who hasn't voted yet, exercise your democratic right, get out, vote, whoever it's for, but please give me a birthday gift, vote for rental. <laughs> And I, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask, what happens if it, if it doesn't go your way tonight? Uh, is, is Chess Crosby the leader that you want to be going up against? You know, you always respect the, uh, the voice of the electorate. Um, but, I mean, we feel very confident Paul is going to do well. Uh, you know, without uh, anything disparaging against the other candidates, I mean, Paul has got a very solid track record in business, mm -hmm. in the volunteer community. Uh, I really believe he'd be the strongest voice for this district. All right. Thank you very much, Tom. My pleasure. Back to you guys. All right, of course, there's another candidate involved in all this. Thank you, Ryan. Carrie Claire Neal is running for the NDP, and she's a newcomer. She is a newcomer to politics, and uh, you caught up with her earlier today. I did, in that rain. <laughs> right, Carrie Claire Neal, today is fine of the day. How are you feeling? Excited. It's uh, been a fun campaign, and uh, I'm excited that it's finally uh, coming to an end. As a, a political newcomer, what have you learned during this campaign? I have learned that people are ready for change. They uh, are excited to see someone who has more progressive ideas on how we can run our economy and um, a new face in our uh, Newfoundland politics. And as you've been campaigning, going door to door as you have even today, the last day of this by-election, what are your thoughts regardless of the result tonight? What's, what's your future? I will definitely continue to have a future in Newfoundland and Labrador politics. It's uh, the support I've received uh, since I've announced my nomination. My campaign has been incredible. People seem really excited that I'm running, and I'll definitely run again. Right. And the reception as you've gone door-to-door, -door, what's it been like? Incredible. Uh, people seem uh, really excited to uh, have a fresh face in the pol political scene. Okay, and any predictions for the result tonight? I'm feeling really good about it. It's going to be exciting to see the results for sure. Okay, well, listen, uh, good luck. Appreciate your time today, and uh, we'll see what happens. Thanks for having me. Now, in some international news, the World Anti-Doping Agency has declared Russia's athletic drug testing program back in business. The country spent nearly three years under sup uh, suspension because of a state-sponsored doping scheme. Essentially, it allows a group of athletes uh, 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 with a government-sponsored doping system straight back into the Olympics. The anti-doping agency backtracked on two key conditions it had set after Russia's suspension in late 2015. Russia was supposed to accept a report that concluded state involvement in the doping and cover-ups. It was also supposed to give access to lab evidence. Neither has happened. 
And now the decision to reinstate Russia is not sitting well with Canadian Olympian Becky Scott. She resigned her position on WADA's Compliance Review Committee after it recommended the reinstatement of Russia last week, and she talked to the CBC about her decision. I think this is a massive blow to the credibility of the organization. And athletes, as I said, have been speaking up. They have been very vocal. They have been sharing their messages globally about how they feel about this. And, and effectively, the athletes did not get a vote today, and the athletes were clearly not heard. And for an organization whose constituents are athletes, and who set the policies and the rules and regulations by which athletes must comply, this is very disappointing. Well, Scott won a bronze medal in cross-country skiing at the 2002 Winter Games, and that was upgraded to gold two years later when the top two... Campaigning in Windsor Lake is just about over. Time for the voters to pick a new MHA. CBCNL brings you the by-election results live as they come in. Who wins? Who loses? Stick with us tonight on Facebook Live and on YouTube shortly after the polls close at 8 o'clock Island Time. Well, not much time for the parties to get the vote out, as they say in the political game, and sometimes weather mixes in with politics. The conventional wisdom being if the weather's not great, voter turnouts down. What was it like in St. John's Day? It seemed to be raining every time it I got out of a like car. Interval oh, no, it was showers. Weird. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was sun, sunny one second and then it was pouring another second. So it was just that kind of pattern all day long. Yeah. Good day for rainbows, though. I saw a rainbow. Again? Yeah, coming into work today. <laughs> so
Well, it was a kind of a strange day. Yeah. So the uh, I know a lot of voters tend to go out after they've had their dinner, their yeah. supper, and uh, so it's not too bad right now. No, it's is not it? too bad, but it's still we're going to be continuing with that pattern for a bit tonight. So you may encounter a shower if you head out. So if you're going to go out to vote, uh, you know, bring an umbrella or wear your raincoat and rubber boots just in case. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So uh, we do have more rain on the way on the weekend. Uh, here's a look at how things are playing out tonight on the Avalon Peninsula. You can see what I was talking about with those uh, showers continuing for a bit tonight, but then starting to clear off uh, tomorrow. And Friday is actually looking like quite a nice day, very quiet a day weather wise. The west coast of the island could see a few showers, mainly cloudy for Labrador. And then we have this system that's going to be coming through on uh, Friday night. But uh, as for the day tomorrow. We're looking at mainly sunny skies for the east and parts of central temperatures on the island between 12 and 14 degrees uh, on the west coast. Could see a few little showers there as well as up through the straits for Labrador. A mix of sun and cloud uh, for most of Labrador and then the showers you see here for Lab City that that's a potential for later in the day as that system starts to approach uh, Labrador. And Labrador will be hit the hardest by this. We do have a special weather statement in effect for the entire province, though. Everyone's going to get a taste of uh, this system for sure. And you can see the snowfall associated with this. This could be our first snowfall of the season affecting Labrador. So, Nain, you're the ones that uh, will be right in the bullseye of this potential snowfall. And you can see how big the system is. All of these heavy rain showers mostly affecting Labrador. The winds on the coast tomorrow will really ramp up in the afternoon. That's where the highest winds will be. So we are expecting potential wind warnings uh, to be put into effect for uh, Saturday for that area. On the island, we won't get as much of it. The west coast will get the bulk of it, about 25 millimeters of rain expected there. But as it starts to track east, it kind of lessens a little bit. So St. John's, the Avalon Pen Peninsula, expecting only about five to 10 millimeters of rain there and winds probably not quite making it up to warning level, but you'll still want to, uh, you know, put away your patio furniture and anything, any loose materials in your backyard. You just want to secure everything because it is going to be a, a gusty day for sure. So windy for everyone. Temperatures bumping up though with this uh, change in the wind direction. So 17 degrees as the high for uh, the West, eight degrees for Western Labrador and lots of wind wind for eastern Labrador. So for uh, Saturday evening into Sunday, things really clear off. There's a chance of some flurries, though, for western Labrador in behind the system and some showers for the west coast of the island. So Sunday looking quite nice for the east, 14 degrees with a mix of sun and clouds 16 in central. So quite lovely chance of flurries for eastern Labrador and as well for Lab West. So then we're into a, ni a nice stretch of sun and cloud for eastern Newfoundland as well for central areas and uh, for western Newfoundland could see some showers on Sunday, but then clearing off as you begin your work week for eastern Labrador. You can see those flurries there, but then some clearing and cold temperatures on Tuesday and for western Labrador Tuesday looking at some showers moving in there. That's your forecast. Debbie, back to you. Thanks, Carolyn. Now to Alberta, where Alberta's education minister is set to respond to news of a racist, multiple choice question put to students in that province. The social studies quiz was part of a correspondence course requiring test takers to identify a, quote, positive effect of residential schools. The question has apparently been removed, but not before news of it started circulating online, generating outrage and apologies. It was a multiple choice question looking for possible answers to positive effects of residential schools. The choices were children were away from home, children learned to read, children were taught manners, and children became civilized. The questionnaire was created by the Alberta Distance Learning Centre and was used in a correspondence class. The school division has apologized. Now the education minister will do the same thing. Corrections officials in Nova Scotia have hit pause on a pilot project that gave inmates limited access to the Internet. A communications company based in Texas sent the province 13 specially designed tablets for free. The province was testing them in jails in Yarmouth and New Glasgow, but as Preston Mulligan reports, the plan to offer online services to the inmates 
did not exactly go as planned. These are the so-called Telmate tablets. Inmates at the provincial jails in Yarmouth and New Glasgow are testing them out. It makes sense to us, it keeps communication, it keeps connection to the community, which is extremely important for inmates as they get ready to be returned back out. Inmates here at the New Glasgow Jail are supposed to use the devices for legal research, to get drug and alcohol counselling, and for continuing education. If they don't want to use these jail phones, they can use the tablet for texting. But anyone who doesn't want an inmate texting them needn't worry. Only those outside users who've downloaded the same messaging application can communicate. Inmates can watch movies and listen to music on a pay-per-use basis. In some of its promotional material, the manufacturer touts the device's ability to, quote, turn wasted time into productive time. Problem is, some inmates were turning them into weapons. We had a few broken. Um, one was uh, assault on another inmate. Another one was broken just by throwing it. Scoville says the pilot project was suspended at the New Glasgow jail because some inmates were able to hack into others' accounts. If there's no protection, and it runs off their inmate accounts, they can obviously delete their resources and obviously for inmates that's extremely important for us to protect that. The devices are also being tested in jails in Alberta and New Brunswick, but jail guards don't like them. We know that they were used as projectiles. Jason McLean, a former guard, says there was no consultation with his members before they were circulated. What my members are saying is they're glad that they have been removed and that they were a liability to the facility and I'm glad that management recognized that, that as well. But. Justice officials say if they can get the bugs worked out, they want the tablets used in jails all over the province. Preston Mulligan, CBC News, Halifax. Well, celebrities seem to have an almost insatiable appetite for cookbooks, and the Duchess of Sussex is no exception. Meghan Markle, Markle rather, launched a cookbook today at Kensington Palace, but this one is well, a little different. CBC's Thomas Deglet has more from London. Well, even before she became the Duchess of Sussex, Meghan always said she aimed to help empower women and girls. And here she is as part of her first solo project as a member of the royal family, launching this cookbook along with the women from a dozen cultural communities who were all impacted in one way or another by the Grenfell Tower fire last year here in London. All women who either lost loved ones or who lost their home in that fire. They eventually started a community kitchen that ran two days a week, making fresh food for members of the community. Megan started to help out and asked them, how about we raise some funds and maybe expand the reach of this kitchen and have it running seven days a week. That's the goal here. And here's what Megan told people at that launch today. Working on this project for the past nine months has been a tremendous labor of love. I had just recently moved to London and I felt so immediately embraced by the women in the kitchen with your warmth and your kindness and also to be able to be in the city and to see in this one small room how multicultural it was. On a personal level, I feel so proud to live in a city that can have so much diversity. This is also a continuation of Meghan's personal brand, even before she became a member of the royal family, a self-described foodie, someone who also worked as a volunteer in a soup kitchen when she lived in Toronto and uh, worked, of course, as an actor. I asked the royal correspondent for the Sunday Times, Roy Anika, about what all this says about Meghan as a member of the royal family. On her wedding day, when her website went up on the royal family's website, she said, I'm, I'm a woman and I'm proud to be a feminist. And I think the fact that she's getting stuck in on her first project with a group of strong women who are survivors, who've survived this awful tragedy, speaks a lot to the kind of work she's going to take forward in the royal family. The cookbook called Together will be available in Canada next week. Megan wrote the foreword and in it, she talks about her favorite dishes. Among them, she says, from her time in Toronto, poutine. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. Here's today's viewer Aww. photo of the day. Look at these beautiful creatures. Isn't that just so sweet? It's a heart tugger. <laughs> it is. I'll let you know where in the province this was taken after the break. With no clues. <laughs> <laughs> nope. None at all. I don't care where it was. That's pretty. <laughs>
Welcome back once again. Justin Bieber seems to have returned to his musical roots this week. Yeah, a very low-key performance in London. So that's Bieber sitting just outside Buckingham Palace. Uh, there weren't too many people around to hear the mega star, though. He was reportedly serenading his fiancée, Haley Baldwin. Bieber launched his global career by busking way back when in his hometown of Stratford, Ontario. I wonder, did anybody yeah. put yeah. any money that's in right. the case? <laughs> yes. Throw, oh my, she actually just gave him some money. Do you know who you just gave money to? And no one recognized him? Yeah. Wow. That's the outfit. <laughs> and he's applied to become an American. I didn't know. Oh, really? Yes, he has. He started to do, change his citizenship. Oh. Yeah. I think it's, he's looking for dual, though. Oh, he's hoping okay. For. So it's not totally bye-bye yeah. Bieber. Oh, I'm sure Trump will, sta <laughs> Trump will stamp that right away. No <laughs> question. Right. All right, let's have a look at our viewer photo of the day. Just love this one. This was taken in port -au -Chois. We oh. had a picture from there recently, actually, at Point uh, Rich. Oh, mm -hmm. Yes, yes, so I remember. It is a beautiful picture. Love it. Frank Walter sent this in, and he had the subject <laughs> caribou cuddles. So <laughs> I thought so that was very appropriate. Fuzzy and soft, right? <laughs> Yeah, just lovely. So Very if you have nice. a photo, please send it in at mm -hmm. uh, email it to nlphotos at cbc.ca. That's a beauty. So just another reminder before you mm -hmm. uh, leave, you're heading over to... Yeah, we're going to be covering, that's right, we're covering the by-election. You can go to our website and check it out. we will be on Facebook Live as well as YouTube. And we're going to go on the air shortly after 8 o'clock island time, obviously, when uh, the polls close. And we'll bring you the results and we'll find out who the winners and losers are tonight. It's always the tense part of politics. Uh -huh. I wonder from, what's going to happen. Yeah. From the word, it's pretty close. Yeah. So <laughs> it should be an interesting one to follow. Yeah. And of course, we'll bring you more details tomorrow. Thanks for being with us. Have a great night. Good night.